As you know, we've been walking slowly but surely through the final hours of Jesus' life over the last few weeks. Maybe it's just me, but these sermons have been hitting a bit close to the bone. They've been, they've been tough ones. I said to Shireen this week, I said, gee, I hope, these, I hope the people are not starting to get you know, upset with me because these are kind of getting close. Today we're going to speak about Peter, and we saw him already last week and how he started to get things wrong in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we continue along, and we're going to go back, first of all, to just after the Lord's Supper in Luke chapter 20, uh, 22. And Jesus says this to him. Remember, he was also known as Simon. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. He replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. And then a little later, when the leaders have come to arrest Jesus, the story continues. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you're also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. Have you ever had a day you, you just wished could be over? You just wish you could do it over, in fact. A day, everything went so wrong, you climb into bed at the end of the day, too upset to sleep, so heavy in your heart. I think Peter had one of those days. Everything was going fine for this guy. He'd helped to set up the Passover. They had a nice meal with Jesus. And then at the end of the meal, Jesus stands up and says, well, he's going to betray me. Peter jumps up and says, I'm going to follow you to death and to, or to prison. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're going to deny me three times. They go off to the garden to pray. Peter falls asleep again and again. He jumps up when Judas comes and swings his sword and cuts off an innocent bystander's ear. Jesus has to rebuke him. And then as they drag Jesus off, he hides and, and stays at a distance. Eventually he denies him and, and everything hits Peter in a moment and he goes outside and weeps. I mean, what a day. I can imagine Peter going off to bed and just staring at the ceiling, not able to sleep. A day he wished he could do over. And so maybe you're here today also looking for a do-over, also looking for a new start in your life, you know, realizing that maybe you haven't quite gone the way you should have in your life. Maybe your connection to, to God has not been as strong as you claimed it was going to be or as you promised. Maybe you can also relate to Pete. We can all relate to Peter, in fact. And I think, firstly, we can all relate to Peter because the enemy was trying to get him. Peter and Satan were in a bit of a battle here. And we can all relate to him because the same is true for all of us. Jesus said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. That's a picture of being destroyed, of like wheat being run through a, a sieve, right? So that there's nothing left. And according to Jesus, Satan was the one who asked God to do this. Do you believe in Satan? A lot of people don't anymore. They think, oh, it's silly superstition. You know, it's old school. We've, we've progressed past that sort of thinking in our lives. I believe in Satan. Jesus spoke about Satan. Jesus mentioned him. Jesus, if Jesus believed in Satan, then ah, it's good enough for me. Do you remember the old saying that the greatest trick the, the devil ever played was convincing the world that he didn't exist? Maybe that's true. Maybe the greatest mistake we can make is to deny that there is an evil enemy who's trying to knock us off of our game, who's trying to pull us away from God, who's trying to sift us like wheat. Truth is, if you take Jesus seriously, you have to take Satan seriously because that's how Jesus did it. 
Jesus spoke about seeing Satan cast from heaven. He spoke of Satan as the ruler of this world, as a thief who would come to steal and kill and destroy. I think we're all a bit like Peter because we're all in a battle with evil. If you look closely at the sentence, Jesus said, Satan has asked all of you, has asked to sift all of you as wheat, not just Peter, all the disciples, and by extension, all of the followers of Jesus throughout the centuries. We still have an enemy who is out to harm us by drawing us away from God. Now, Hal Lindsey wrote a book, a famous book called The Late Great Planet Earth. But he also wrote a book which was called Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. And the book begins with him talking about some obvious satanic activity in the world, your witchcraft and spiritualism and mediums and psychics and movements like that, tarot cards. But later in the book, he begins to talk of the more subtle ways that the enemy starts to come after believers. He talks about how Satan will trick believers into legalism, legalism, which is believing so much in following the laws of the Bible that that will make you right with God, that soon you're, you're mean and you're judgmental and you're self-righteous to others, just like Satan, right? And then he talks about how Satan will trick other believers into license, which means thinking, God loves me, I can just do what I want. I've got a free license to do what I want and he'll just forgive me. And soon you're impure, you're worldly, you're selfish, just like Satan. And he talks about Satan's way of making us feel guilt-ridden and ashamed and pulling us away from God. Peter was in danger here of being pulled away from God, from Jesus. And friends, so are you, so am I. Every day of our lives, we're in danger. And I'm not trying to spook you. I'm not trying to create like a panic in your life. I'm trying to just make you aware that you need to know that there's an enemy. I'm trying to warn you in fact, Peter later in his life said this, if we go to 1 Peter chapter 5, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He knew this personally. That very day, this is exactly what had happened to him. Jesus told him this very truth at the Lord's Supper by saying, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And so I ask you today, does your faith look like a, a sober alert faith where you're aware that there's an enemy and you live in victory over him are we cognizant of the fact that we're in a war we're in a battle with the enemy and with God's help we can overcome and live good and holy lives John Piper the American preacher he often talks about prayer as a walkie talkie a wartime walkie talkie and I love what he says here listen to this I like to contrast the wartime walkie talkie of prayer with the domestic intercom what I like to say is that one of the reasons prayer malfunctions in people's lives is because they take a wartime walkie talkie and try to turn it into a domestic intercom in which they ring up God the butler to bring another pillow to them but prayer was designed for the battlefield as a wartime walkie-talkie, not to increase the ease of the saints, but to help them through the war. And I love that picture. Think about your prayers. Are you, are you engaged in this battle and calling on God, like with a wartime walkie-talkie in prayer, calling to God the commander to come and help you, to come and give you strength, to come and empower you? Or is prayer for you more, Lord, come and bring me another pillow? Satan is prowling around looking to devour. Friends, let our lives be a deep commitment to overcoming the enemy with God's help. Living sober and aware lives like Peter came to live later. You see, if we don't do that, if we don't live sober and aware lives, we end up doing what Peter did that night. Number two, we slip into sin. Peter and son. Let's read again what happened. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with Jesus, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. Denial number one. A little later, someone else had, saw him and said, you're also one of them. Man, I'm not. Number two. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for he's a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. I don't know Jesus, I'm not one of his followers. The very man who earlier, earlier in the evening had said, I'm ready to die for you, Lord. 
How often we make big promises for God and then don't follow through. How often our practice doesn't match our ideals. Now perhaps it's true that Peter's biggest mistake was getting separated from Jesus in these moments. We read this in verse 54. Seizing him, Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. Followed at a distance, he didn't keep close. He didn't retain the intimacy. He stayed just, in, just close enough to see Jesus, but not close enough to talk to him or to be part of the journey. And this is a picture of our lives. This is a picture of our lives. It's one of the things Satan most fervently tries to do, is to put distance between us and Jesus. Think about your life. Is Jesus right here with you? Are you living a close, intimate relationship with him? Or is is he kind of over there? You, You can see him. It's not that you're not a Christian, but he's over there and you're over here. Maybe you distance yourself from Jesus like Peter did because you're afraid. You think if I really follow Jesus, it's gonna hurt. You know, there might be a bit of sacrifice involved. I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to get uh, bound in chains. Let me distance myself from being too close. Or maybe you distance yourself from Jesus because you're ashamed. You're ashamed. You think, oh, he doesn't want anything to do with me. I've messed up. Let me just keep my distance. Maybe you've just gotten so busy. Maybe you've just gotten so busy in your life that you You haven't connected with him lately. Friends, don't let distance grow between you and Jesus. Don't find yourself where you're over here outside and he's over there where it it matters. It's so easy for us to fall into this because life just pulls us away. We get busy. We start watching things we shouldn't. We listen to the wrong things. We get caught up in the wrong things. Next thing we know, we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. And again, this is why prayer is so important. Prayer for some people is just reeling off a list, right? Let me just tick off, I've prayed for this, 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 okay, I'm done. That's not prayer. God is not the divine butler. God is, God is supposed to be with you in your camp and you fight with, alongside God and you wrestle with God and you love God and you walk with him close. Are you praying all throughout your day so that you're close? Peter talk, likes to talk about cling and focus, right? That's his, his new book that he's written about cling and focus. Cling means stay close, stay close. Don't see him over there, but cling to God and stay close to him. And without that, when we get vulnerable, our denials get mixed up. Yes, you heard me right. Our denials get mixed up because you see, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We're called to a life of denial, but it's a life of self-denial, not denying God. It's a life of denying what we might benefit from, but it'll still take us away from God. Deny yourself of those things, and in the end, go to Jesus. But Peter got it wrong. He denied Jesus instead of denying himself. And that's what sin is when you choose to deny your faith instead of denying yourself. You see, when we read this story, I've often thought about how you know, we mustn't deny Jesus. So if someone asks you if you're a follower, you mustn't deny it. But I think most of us wouldn't do that in our culture. Maybe you would. Maybe you would at work. You would say, oh, no, I'm not a Christian. But I think most of us would say, yes, I'm a Christian. It's not so much about saying, oh, I don't know Jesus, but it's about living in a way that denies him. Isn't every temptation... Isn't every temptation the enemy asking you to deny Jesus and, and fulfill your own selfish desires? I think every temptation is Satan saying, will you do it God's way or your way? Choose your way. It'll be nice. It'll be more pleasurable. Don't deny yourself, the enemy says. Treat yourself. Before we know it, we've denied Jesus because we've chosen to deny the wrong thing. Peter lost the battle, he lost the fight, he chose the wrong denial. And so we see the sad picture number three of Peter's sorrow at the end of the chapter. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows, today you'll disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. Man, I wonder what the look in Jesus' eyes was that moment. I've often thought about it. Some people would say he was angry. He turned and looked at him with anger, I don't think so. I think it was a look of sadness. Shireen always says to me, with the grade twos, 
the worst thing you can say to them is, I'm disappointed in you. Not I'm angry at you. I'm angry at you does nothing to them. They don't care. But if you say, oh, I'm so disappointed in you, that's when they start to feel it, right? Maybe it's the same with us and God. Maybe in this moment, Jesus looked and he, the disappointment in his eyes was there. But sorrow is the right response to having let God down. Throughout the Bible, the faithful people of God weep and mourn when they realize they've sinned. And perhaps there's a sense in which there's not enough of that in the world anymore. When we realize God's looking at us and we've sinned, maybe we should be mourning over our sins more. But here's the key. The key is to go to Jesus with your mourning rather rather than distancing yourself further. Notice what Peter did here. He realized that he'd sinned and so he distance himself even further he went outside and wept and so he went further from Jesus to weep before this he was inside the courts he was warming himself at the fire but now he, it dawns on him oh I've, I've messed up and so he distances himself further from Jesus that's the wrong move that's the wrong move and friends I think this is a mistake you and I all make so often when we realize you know what I've let him down we think, okay, he's now gonna be upset with me. Let me distance myself from him. We're convinced God's gonna be angry, and so we distance ourselves. Have you been there? You know you've messed up, so you stop praying. You stop reading your Bible. You maybe don't come to church for a while. You don't talk to your Christian friends. You think to yourself, if they knew me, the real me, they would kick me out. The wrong move. The wrong move, I think Satan is even more pleased when our sin causes us to move outside the courts and further from God instead of going to him with our sin. Now, Hal Lindsey in that book, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth, he tells a story, I'd like to read it. He said, there's nothing Satan likes better than to get a believer started on a guilt trip. As I look back over my life, I realize that guilt is a handle that the devil constantly tries to grab to steer me. And a classic illustration comes to my mind, which happened to me in my third year in seminary. One fellow was a real close buddy of mine. We had three years of great times together. Then I borrowed some money from him, and I told him I'd be able to pay it back in about two weeks. After a week, I began to be concerned about where the money was coming from. But I had another week to work on it, so I wasn't too worried. The second week went by, and I just couldn't raise the money anywhere. And I felt kind of strained around my friend. I didn't bring the subject up, because I hoped he'd forgotten about the date. And as the days went by, it seemed to me as though he was looking at me with an accusing expression every time I saw him. So I did my best to stay out of his way. After the deadline had passed by two weeks, I began planning my day so I wouldn't have to be near him. It was awful. I felt terrible to have lost such a good friend. But on the other hand, I couldn't see why he wasn't more understanding of my problem. Mind you, not a word had passed between us regarding the money, but I felt so guilty that I was sure he'd written me off. Finally, one day to my horror, I saw him coming toward me in the hall. There was no place to hide. He cornered me and said, okay, what's the matter with you, Hal? I said, well, it's about the money I owe you. He laughed and put a big hand on my shoulder and said, brother, I thought it was that. Look, I haven't changed. I don't feel any different towards you than I did a few weeks ago. If you had the money, I know you'd pay me. But money doesn't mean much to me. Your friendship means more and I'm still your friend. For three weeks, I'd been going around thinking he was condemning me, but that wasn't true at all. He was still my best friend. Do you see the points? How often do we mess up with God and then we just distance ourselves and then we think that he's condemning us? And all the while he's saying, come to me. I'm still who I am. I haven't changed. I'm still your father. I will still love you. I'll forgive you. Ruan says it often in our men's group. He says, if we sin, we must go straight to Jesus straight to Jesus we mustn't wait we must go straight to him because that's when we will find that forgiveness and so oh Peter oh Peter why did you distance yourself from Jesus when you could have gone straight to him in that moment imagine if Peter had broken through the crowds and run to Jesus even in his chains and thrown his arms around him wow that's what you and I can do Run to Jesus, don't distance yourself further because you see in the end, friends, Jesus still had a plan for Peter and he's still got a plan for you. In spite of his denial, Jesus still wanted to strengthen Peter, number four. Peter being strengthened by Jesus so that he could strengthen others. Remember Jesus' words from earlier that night, I've prayed for you, Simon, Peter, that your faith may not fail. 
And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Think about this. Jesus knew Peter would deny him, but he said, I have prayed that your faith may not fail. That's fascinating to me. Because Jesus, foreseeing what he would do, I I would think he would have said, "Uh, I've prayed for you, Peter, but your faith is going to fail. But he says, I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Do you see the power in this, friends? Your faith, I've prayed that your faith may not fail, even though Peter would deny him. Here's the thing, if you make a wrong denial and you throw your faith under the bus, instead of denying yourself, it's not the end of the road. You may have lost a battle, but you haven't lost the war. You don't need to give up your faith because you've messed up. You can still come back and be strengthened by Jesus so that you can strengthen others. Now as Nazarenes, we believe deeply in sanctification. We believe God can make us holy and we can live holy lives free from the power of willful sin. But one of the great early Nazarenes was a man named Christian Walmer Ruth, C.W. Ruth. I read a lot of this guy's writings when I changed over to the Nazarene church and, and loved his writings. He wrote a book called Temptations Peculiar to the Sanctified. And there's a chapter in there which is called What to Do in Case of Defeat. And I want to read you a little paragraph and I want you to think about Peter. Listen to what he said. When the children of Israel suffered defeat at Ai, which was a place they were in, because of an enemy in the camp, they were not obliged to return all the way to Egypt and start all over again. No, they simply acknowledged the defeat, uncovered the enemy within the camp, and remained in the land of Canaan and went on to victory. If they'd refused to acknowledge defeat, they would have fallen apart and the Lord would have forsaken them and the enemies would have, them driven them back, would have then driven them back clean out of the land of Canaan. This picture was so important to me. He said, okay, if you've faced a defeat, you don't have to now give up and go all the way back to the land of slavery. Just acknowledge the defeat, confess it, and move forward. Isn't this what God expects of you and I when we mess up? He doesn't want us to beat ourselves up and knock ourselves back and and throw the whole thing in. He says, acknowledge the defeat, get rid of the enemy, and move on to victory. Stay in the promised land. Thankfully, Peter did this. Think about this. Peter did it because Peter came back to Jesus and found redemption. Peter didn't say, I've messed up, I'm done. I've really messed up, let me just fall apart. That's what Judas did. Judas messed up and he said, I've gone too far. And he went out and hanged himself. Peter came back to Jesus and found redemption. Friends, your faith doesn't have to fail just because you've had a defeat. If you had a defeat today, you don't need to say, oh, I'm so far gone. Acknowledge your defeat and then walk on because God will not condemn you if you are his. God will forgive you and help you to walk on in victory as you go. So, do you relate to Peter? I think you do. I do. Right, Peter was in battle with Satan. So are you. So am I. Peter sinned and denied Christ instead of denying himself. We always face temptations to do the same. Peter's sin caused him great sorrow and at first he ran away from Jesus, fearing condemnation. But once he learned Jesus was alive, he went back to Jesus found redemption. What about you today? Where are you in your journey with God? Is it time for you to remember you're in a battle and start fighting? Is it time for you to begin a lifestyle of self-denial rather than denying Jesus? Is it time for you to come to the feet of Jesus with your sin instead of running away? Is it time for you to admit your defeat but carry on in victory? I want to pray with you as we close and if you saw yourself in Peter today, I hope you'll pray with me and find that redemption that he found. Let's pray. Oh, Father, Peter is just another man, just like every one of us. Nothing exalted about him. All of us today relate to this man in his struggles. All of us today realize that the same things happen to us. And so, Father, for the person today who has maybe treated their faith a little bit too lightly, gotten too comfortable, prayed more for ease than for help through the battle. Father, I pray that those people today will come to you in this moment and say, Father, I'm back in. Put me in the front lines again. I'm gonna fight this thing. 
I'm going to withstand temptation. I'm going to live the life you've called me to live and resist the devil. I'm back in the war. For those today who have perhaps found themselves denying you instead of denying themselves, Lord, we pray, help me, Lord, in this moment to change. Help me today to forego this type of lifestyle of denying you. But, oh God, help me to live a life of radical self-denial so that your glory comes through. For those who feel distant and who have stepped away from you instead of going to you in their shame, Father, I pray with those people today and say, Lord, please bring me back. Please take me back. And, Lord, in this moment we see your open arms saying, Come, my child, I have not condemned you. I'll forgive you. And, Father, for those who are tempted to just throw the whole thing in because they feel they've gone too far. Remind us that we don't have to go back to land of slavery, but we can keep living in the promised land of salvation, moving on, admitting our defeat, but moving on because we are yours. And so, Father, we leave here today transformed and redeemed by your grace. Oh, let it be that our lives in this week to come our lives that please you and honor you and show the world around us that there is a God of love who can bring transformation. We thank you for your word to us today. In Jesus' name.